Good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Boland. I am the academic chair of the Preston Robert Tisch Center, and it's my distinct honor to welcome you this morning to our, our day panel with a subject matter that could not be more important or more relevant, perhaps the single biggest issue in shaping the future, the sustainable and green uh, initiatives that we can have in hospitality, lodging, and tourism, presaging all the wonderful opportunities we have for the, the future of, of the world will be in green initiatives and innovation. So just as nations who conquered their vast interiors or conquered the seas were capable of determining the future in the past, so now the future of, of our world depends on those who, uh, who can green and, uh, and do so successfully. So this is no more sustainable issue, or no more important issue than sustainability. And it's my incredible pleasure to welcome everyone here this morning on behalf of our extraordinary president, John Sexton, the trustees of New York University, and our Dean Bjorn Hansen, who could not be with us today. I want to extend our incredible welcome to all who have journeyed whether from Luzon, whether from across Washington Square, or from anywhere else in the, in the, greater, uh, the greater part of the global network, as President Sexton calls it. Uh, we, uh, we welcome guests today who uh, share an extraordinary location endowment, as uh, President Sexton likes to call ours. You have but to look, look out the window and note ours. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to, to have visited Luzon and visited Switzerland, and they share a similar location endowment. While, while theirs is natural and ours is created uh, by the work of humankind, we, are, we share beauty and, and, and energy and vitality, and I can't say with greater, greater confidence that there is no greater partnership than what we've, what we've established today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce His Excellency Ambassador Francois Barras, uh, the Consul General of the Nation of Switzerland and their Ministry of the United Nations, to welcome as, as our co-host. On behalf of NYU, we welcome you and thank you, His Excellency Ambassador Barras. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear alumni, the hospitality industry is growing rapidly and is really a, a true a global one. And uh, being a global industry, it has to respond to global challenges. And as uh, Mr. Bolan just said, one of the main global challenges we face is sustainable development and especially climate change. So uh, I feel it is really uh, important and I welcome this panel, um, the panel of this morning. And uh, I welcome the fact that two important leading uh, academic institution partner to talk about green hospitality, to talk about sus sustainable development in the hospitality industry. And this in partnership with uh, my country, Switzerland, and a program we have called Think Swiss. So uh, about the partners, the Ecole Hôtelière de Lausanne, uh, all of you know that uh, it was uh, founded uh, in the late 19th century, in 1893, and it's one of the leading academic institution in the field, famous for this unique combination of practical training and, and theory. And they have uh, the Ecole Hôtelier de Lausanne as a network of alumni, which is incredibly uh, active and, uh, and efficient. It's also um, a school where graduates don't only go into the hospitality industry, but are very much looked after by uh, companies all over, all over the world. New York University, the, the link with Switzerland is important because one of the founders, the main founders, Albert Galatin, was Swiss, was from Geneva. So uh, you see the name Galatin all over New York University. And um, Galatin was the second Secretary of Treasury in, of the United States and was a Swiss immigrant from Geneva. And in the later part of his life, he founded the New York University. We also admire very much your university for its global outreach. And I think that uh, Switzerland and all the Ecole Hôtelier de Lausanne can learn a lot about uh, the way uh, New, York Uni New York University is really trying to be, to be a global institution. The government of Switzerland, Switzerland 
uh, tries very hard to promote itself as a country of innovation, which it is. We are uh, one of the countries in the world where scientific research is the most developed. And uh, we have, in this country, a program called Think Suisse, which promotes dialogue in the field of innovation between Switzerland and the United States. And today's program is supported by Think Suisse. Think Suisse is very active in uh, energy saving, in finance, in urban planning, public transportation, and uh, life sciences. So uh, uh, really today's panel really enters very well into the framework of what uh, Think, Suisse, uh, Think Suisse does. I would like to thank very much the New York University, the dean of, uh, and uh, the vice dean of the Tisch School, and especially Mr. Rakish Malek for having worked with my team to make this event a success. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. My name is uh, Ray Yunus. I'm a professor at EHL, Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne in Switzerland. And I'm very glad that we are together here because I think that we are sharing a passion, and this passion is for hospitality. And hospitality today is more than an industry, it's a function in any company, and it's an art. It's an art We explain in which way we can transform a client into a guest, and a guest in a brand ambassador. And believe me, in Europe, everybody, everybody look to hospitality experts, and they want their knowledge because they want to apply it in all of the business. Because what we are sharing together is some, some soft skills, unique, it's more than just a job, and everybody knows who is active in hospitality. Then thank you very much for sharing this passion together, because today this passion will be green. And it will be green thanks to our guests, who are the leaders in their field. And I have a big pleasure. I was supposed to invite them on stage, but as you can see, they already are on stage. And I just <laughs> want to mention their, their name, because they are really passionate people who have done a lot of effort to be here with us today. Then clinical associate professor at Tisch Center for a School of Hospitality and Tourism and Sport Management, Shar Prohaska. <laughs> Councillor of Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne and CEO of Symbio Suisse, Dr. Claude Begley. Clinical Associate Professor and Director of Center for Sustainable Built Environment from Shark Institute of Real Estate, Constantin Contocosta. <laughs> Head of Innovation and Creativity Center of Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne, Professor Frédéric Delay. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, nevertheless, allow me to invite on stage our distinguished moderator today, and it's very well known in the hospitality industry. I mean it, Hervé, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to, to be here today. Uh, actually, it's a great honor for me to be um, sharing the stage with uh, this great panel. And um, maybe you don't know it, but this morning you took a great uh, risk because it's, it's actually the first time that I will be moderating a panel. And what a panel, uh, four brains, and myself. Um, I just would like to say a few words about what I coined sustainable hospitality. Um, you know, very often, and maybe you as well, if you're passionate like I am, I'm asked, you know, why are you so committed? Why are you so passionate about sustainable development? And why do you want to implement that in the hotel industry? Well, it all started that as a professional, um, I always talked to my team, to my executives, to my managers, but as well to my employees about legacy. Legacy is a very, very important word for me, and I hope it will be one for you as well once you leave uh, this school. Uh, legacy is extremely important in our professional life. But when I turned 40, I had already enjoyed 20 great years in my career, and I thought I received a lot, and I felt I should enlarge my legacy to not only be a professional legacy, but to be more of a human being legacy for the next 20 and hopefully 30 years in my profession. And I uh, 
now I'm communicating that to, to my teams as well. It's all about what are you going to leave uh, once you move on, once you leave this property, what will people think about what you've done, what you've achieved. And recently I was in, um, in Las Vegas attending uh, our parent company, IHT, you know, the largest hotel company in the world, um, uh, annual convention, together with 6,134 friends. And I felt a bit lost, I must say. But we had a great guest speaker, uh, a general from the army, and he said something which really uh, triggered a fantastic image for me. He said, you know, when you go to a cemetery, you, um, you go to the tomb of loved ones or relatives or family members, and you see the year they were born and the year they died. And in between, there's a little dash, a very tiny dash. And this is all about what I preach about legacy, your human being legacy. It's all about what people will remember. So always think about, about the dash. To come to the sustainable hospitality and why I feel that hotels should all implement a sustainable development strategy, and actually I go much further, I think every business in the world should implement uh, a sustainable development strategy. Whether you are a big hotel in a city like New York, mine is hidden by a few buildings here, but not far from here, 700 rooms, uh, or a small resort in the Fiji Islands, we consume a lot of energy. We create a lot of waste. We create our own waste, you know, through the kitchen and, uh, of course, the, uh, the vendor's uh, packaging as well. But we collect as well the waste from our customers. <coughs> so for the environmental part, it seems so logical that we have to take care of that. As far as the community is concerned, we do benefit a lot from the community. And for a hotel like the Barclay, I would say that maybe 50 to 60% of our business is generated from within a five or six blocks radius. When you think about the United Nations, when you think about all these great companies which have their head offices just close to us, they send us all their business. So it's really just normal, natural, that we look at what we could do for our communities. Now, as a hotelier, what, what should we do? And you allow me to do a very quick flashback. Up to the 70s, hoteliers were really innkeepers. They really had to offer a great product, hire great people, deliver great service, and that was their marketing. In the 80s, we became more of business people. We really wanted to develop revenue, so we started having sales strategies, marketing strategies, and we as well paid, of course, very much attention to the bottom line, so we really were very conscious of ratios. And we did such a great job that in the 90s, some smarter people, financial people and REITs, started to think that actually the hotel industry was a great industry where they could make money, and they started buying our buildings. So from innkeepers to business people, we became asset managers. We had to develop and focus on developing revenue for every square feet of our properties. So when we turned the 20, to the 21st century, I felt that it was great to focus on customers, definitely, great to focus on the economic bottom line, but we should as well focus on a social responsibility bottom line and as well the environmental protection bottom line, which is coined by a, a fantastic gentleman that I, I'm really lucky to know, John Elkington. 1997 wrote a book called Cannibals with Forks. And when I read his book, I really had, you know, a bulb which lit. Uh, he coined the term triple bottom line, profit, people, and planet. And that's what we will be talking about now. And I just would like to end by a personal message, because today we are celebrating Veterans Day here in America. So as a French people person, we um, celebrate the first anniversary, the, the anniversary of the first, of the, the armistice of the First World War. So just want to take this opportunity to thank America and the Americans for that. You saved us, you saved freedom at that time, you came back, and you seem to be uh, you know, used to that, unfortunately, throughout the world, but just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you, a big thank you to all of you. Now I'm going to move to the panel and, and introduce um, our questions. Thank you. So we, um, we uh, discussed questions, a lot of questions. We have many questions, so the panelists will try to be uh, 
as uh, clear and short as possible in the answers. <laughs> um, and the, it will be um, in, in two major parts. One will be more the sort of overview and uh, regulations and government attitude and responsibilities and certifications and measurements, the, you know, the big stuff, what we need to know about sustainable hospitality. And the other part will be about the three major stakeholders that we face every day in our professional life, owners, customers, and employees. So I'd like to address a, a question to um, some members of the panel here, and whoever wants, feels like answering first, you're welcome. Can you tell us about the current, current situation in the hotel industry or in the real estate industry, and enlarge your answer to the tourism industry about sustainable development? So, who would like to start? Sure, I'll start. So um, well, first off, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with such a distinguished uh, uh, speakers. And also, it's always exciting and encouraging to see these, these bridging the gaps, not only uh, between the U.S. and Europe, but also even just across New York City with the, <laughs> between Shack and the Tisch Center. So it's nice to see even with NY NYU. Um, I think what we're looking at in terms of the real estate industry is, uh, again, comes back to this question of how do we define sustainable development, which in and itself, the ambiguity around that has created a lot of challenges uh, in terms of really beginning to uh, allow owners, allow stakeholders to really define what they're trying to do, develop performance metrics, and, and achieve those, those goals. Um, what we're seeing really in, in a large, uh, kind of the, the major push in the real estate industry is around uh, sustainability being defined as energy efficiency. And there's a focus on energy performance, and the focus on energy performance is really coming from the fact that we can measure it and we can value it. And therefore, we could actually take steps to account for it and also uh, quickly uh, understand the value proposition behind energy efficiency. So the other elements of waste, of water efficiency to a lesser degree, uh, and of course the whole social equity component of, of sustainable development uh, has become a little bit tougher to, to begin to address, uh, but I think we're starting to see some, some new efforts emerge in those areas. What was it going to be? You talked about tourism? Yes. Uh, from the tourism perspective, it's a little bit different because the tourism interest in sustainability hear? really evolved after about 2002, where sustainable development's been on the radar screen since the Brundtland report, but we, it's really basically new for the tourism industry. So we um, still are working on developing guidelines, developing uh, ways to measure uh, how the sustainability can be used in the tourism industry. And it's a little bit harder, too, because tourism is so diversified. So you aren't just looking at a hotel or looking at a building, but we have everything from tour operators to wholesalers to destinations and all those things. So I must say there is a new organization that has been formed uh, just in, within the last year that's in Washington, D.C., and it's on global sustainable tourism initiatives. And I know Irv is working on that. I'm a member of that. And I have great hopes because, as we were talking earlier, they've now worked on just one of the, what, 23 areas? Two. That they're going Hotels to be... The, the, with the operators. But then they're going to address all these other standards and guidelines, which is very, very optimistic. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, the hospitality and tourism sustainability for me is linked to seven points. Number one is construction, which accounts for roughly 40% of the CO2 emissions. Number two, mobility. Well, you can save on your operation if people fly 5,000 miles, your carbon offset balance sheet will be pretty negative. Three, as you said, energy efficiency which is how to reduce the units of energy for your consumption and renewability, the origin of your energy. Number four, the waste management. How do you recycle materials? And uh, there is more and more the understanding that some of the raw materials don't exist anymore in the mines, but we call it city mining. You have to recycle something which exists already in the city. So it's a circular economy. And waste management where you can, for example, reconvert part of the waste back to petrol. Uh, fifth, the natural food ingredients. So it's both the proximity to avoid the CO2 linked to the transport and the bio and natural component. Six, it's the processes which brings efficiency and is linked to people management. And seventh is the cultural aspect. And here I'm talking more about tourism. 
you may easily kill a culture by bringing uneducated tourists. So, as a nutshell, I think that the hospitality and tourism sector, which is one of the largest and fast growing in the world, is a holistic experience, and all those aspects have to be embraced if we really want to think sustainable development. Back to you. One last aspect, obviously, is, is developing the people behind all those initiatives. And um, as part of an academic institution, it's very important that all these aspects of sustainable development kind of are permeating every fields of education, and especially uh, you know, in the field of hospitality management. It's also good to prepare the leaders that will push forward those initiatives, and uh, we can't start too soon on that. Thank you. What, what, what do you see as the main roadblocks actually, um, to applying sustainable development principles in, in the in industry in general? Um, Constantine, maybe? Sure. Um, well, I think there's four, the, the, the jump, four categories that have really kind of jumped out, which are um, behavioral issues. So how do you not only change occupant behavior in buildings, but more importantly, change uh, building managers and facility managers' understanding and use of, and control of buildings? Uh, the second would be regulatory measures, kind of code issues, building and zoning code issues. and, and and in many cases, like in New York City, where uh, the fire code prohibits or requires that half of any flat roof be actually open for fire access. And then if you have stair bulkheads and other things, it becomes very difficult to install solar panels, for example. You're left with a lot of little room. So coordinating across different codes. Um, uh, technological issues in terms of technologies that exist, although the, there's uh, technologies already exist to get us quite easily to 30 to 40 percent energy savings in buildings, but technologies that exist at a cost effect in a cost effective manner, uh, and the last is really capital issues, providing money and financing for for these kind of uh, improvements and sustainable development. And I should say that the focus really in in the U.S. and particularly in major established cities like in New York and Western Europe, uh, cities in Western Europe as well, is on retrofitting our existing building stock. It's not about new construction. In New York, new construction, if you're building a Class A office building or a Class A hotel in New York City, it will be a green building. There's no other way around it. You have to try hard for it not to be a green building. Um, so we're focused on how do we retrofit the existing building stock. Uh, and just the last point on this is that there's actually been, for people who are tracking this, I mean, you can make a, a living out of going to conferences on sustainable real estate, sustainable development, green building. Uh, you could just you could go to them all day long, uh, every day of the week. So what's interesting, finally, is that we're moving past the discussion of challenges and roadblocks and actually getting to solutions. So there's a lot of good measures out there that are, uh, that are working to understand best practices and also free up capital and free up money and financing to actually do these kind of improvements. In the tourism industry, I would say probably one of the biggest issues right now is education. And because we are such a fractured industry and, and covers so many different areas, that we have to be able to get the information out there and to educate people on the importance of it and how it can benefit their business. Another area that's a problem, I think, is that so much of our industry is seasonal. And so a lot of times there's, uh, when there's so many small businesses operating in this field, they are looking at short-term profits, not necessarily looking at long-term returns. And that is probably uh, one of the biggest issues right now. And then we talked earlier about guidelines and measurement, but that's still in the process. So in another two or three years, we'll be down the road a ways. What are the roadblocks? I would see six. The number one is mental uh, and awareness. There's a lot of things which are nice to have, but are you really ready to prepare to pay for it? The second is financial. Uh, there are a lot of those sustainable development measures which cost more, mm -hmm. and uh, our companies have very, very strict quarterly targets, financially speaking. So what can you do for the long term while remaining within the contract you have with your employer in terms of uh, quarterly results? The third is technical. Very often manages to measure. You, you manage what you can measure, and how can you measure some of the things? Partially, yes, but after we'll come and see the conversion between the various measurement systems can be complicated. The fourth is regulatory. Uh, because much of the sustainable development measures are still more costly, uh, so you need an intervention of the state or the parliament, which defines what's the rule. And um, the fifth is uh, legacy. Here in the US and in Europe, sometimes we have a lot of things where we can't. In Europe, you want to bring uh, a windmill 
um, immediately you have also the same people who are in favor of defense of the nature. They say, hey, but not here, because you're disturbing the birds, the this, the that, the that. Uh, in the cities, we have to maintain the quality, the, the old historical value of the city. So sometimes what you will see in emerging countries, in those new urban developments, they start from a white page and they can go straight to the next generation. We have legacy. It's good to have legacy, as you said before, but sometimes it's also a block. And finally, it's a certain level of hypocrisy. We all speak about saving the planets. We all speak about climate change. It happens that about 80% of that is an overlap with uh, the energy supply. And at the end, everybody thinks about energy supply and not save the planet. So we speak a lot. We do much less than what we say. And actually, I have a question for, um, for, for Frederick Dele, uh, which is following this uh, point, which is, is green a, ma a marketing gimmick, or is it really a strategic tool? Well, I think <coughs> if we want to answer that question, we have to look a little bit outside the hospitality sector to see what's happening. And uh, if you look at, in terms of the general public, the, the success a few years ago of Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth movie, if you look at the automotive industry and Toyota selling more than a million hybrid cars, GM movie, moving away from SUVs, if you look even the financial sector, uh, sustainability investment funds, carbon trading markets, really sustainability issues have permeated a lot of different industries. And those are signs really of a strong undercurrent and almost a tectonic shift and not really a fad. So it's here to stay. And um, we're almost at a tipping point where it will make financial, great financial sense to just be involved in this because two billion people are aspiring to the same level of quality of life as, uh, as we have. Um, the, the era of cheap commodity prices, we can fairly say, is over. And uh, it will be part of business as usual very soon. Uh, no one uh, uh, reconsiders health, safety in the workplace or a continuing education and sustainability will just be another one of those day-to-day -day business practices. And still talking about in general terms, but um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bigley, um, we speak more often about environment than social responsibility. Um, how do you think that we could, you know, the concern about social equity be uh, integrated um, in hospitality development? Well, this is a very fundamental question because sustainable development, as you all know, is environmental, economical, and social. Now, it's a balancing act. Now, we tend to think of a balancing act within a community, the New York community, for example. Now, the reality is that you have emerging countries which had much less and which are growing up very fast and you have developed countries. So a guy who was the, well, one of the most brilliant brains in France, Jacques Attali, who was the, the advisor to the President of the Republic, uh, says it's very contradictory to dream to have at the same time social sustainable development and ecological social development. Because you can't ask all those Indians and Chinese not to have a car and to continue to drive a bicycle for the next 200 years. They want to have a lifestyle like ours. But if they start driving cars, you will pollute the planet in an incredible way. So it's a question of finding the right level of balance between allowing other nations to have a lifestyle like ours without creating a drain on the resources. If all Chinese were consuming water like Americans per capita, there would already be a 20% deficit of the drinking water in the world. So we need to find a way, through technology as you said, to bridge the gap between the rising demand and needs of those emerging countries and the fact that we need to save the future of the planet. I would, like yeah. sure. I would say that um, the issue of scale is very important here, and the one of technology. I think there's been a lot of discussion of technology, whether at the building level or at the city level. We hear a lot about smart cities, smarter cities, IBM, Cisco, all these companies are pushing these issues. Um, and I think we have to be wary of the ability of technology to, to be a salvation here, that we have to understand it's the people behind it. And in many cases, the politics and other aspects that, that go into how those technologies are implemented and used that are the critical uh, kind of point here. And then 
then in terms of scale, this issue of the social equity question at, at different scales is, is, is important and is, is very much interconnected, where we have tremendous inequalities in global development. If we see the, the favelas in Rio, the slums outside of Mumbai, and yet Class A lead platinum buildings being both built in both cities. So there's a real question about how we define what sustainable growth is in these types of cities. And then at the local level, we have a much more difficult situation where, or an equally difficult situation, which is how do we incorporate community and social impacts into our development decisions? So things like affordable housing when we're building residential, things like open space, parks and playgrounds, the health uh, environment for the people, for the buildings we're building and the residents we're building them for, those become very difficult because they're very difficult to value and very difficult to value without kind of government intervention and regulation that begins to point developers and point investors in a certain direction. And on the social responsibility side, I do see a much greater trend between the hotel industry and also the tourism industry and tour operators uh, as we're moving towards trying to find the balance of uh, developing programs to give back. And they are, you know, a certain amount of money. They're developing programs, wells, everything in Africa. So they are doing things to try to be social responsibility. And it, it's greater than it used to be, as well as a lot of NGOs that are really being designed as just especially for that, so you can do volunteerism and to try to help other people in the world as it's we move about, forward. It's all about balancing. It is. It's all about the balance, isn't it? Um, I want to take advantage of having people from the other side of the pond. I'm talking about Lake, Lake Lemon <laughs> and, uh, and this side. Um, what are the su sustainable development successes that you've seen in Europe or other parts of the world, maybe, uh, if we want to talk about that as well, and America? And, you know, what are the successes, the failures, or the opportunities for improvements on both sides of the Atlantic? And what should we learn uh, from this? Um, maybe... Uh... Well, Europe has developed an awareness about environmental issues more than the U.S. Absolutely. So you have a number of things which you consider advanced in the U.S. and they're already standard in Europe, especially countries like Germany or Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. They have both in terms of infrastructure, for example, solar panels, and in terms of behavior like waste management in the households, uh, pretty advanced ways. You have in buildings, uh, tough measures in the way how a green building or a normal building must already incorporate some green elements. And uh, also the whole notion of carbon offset trading, which is whenever you pollute, you pay. Uh, all of that has been installed in Europe as a compulsory rule much before the US. Now, interestingly enough, uh, US in some parts is catching up. Well, I'm working personally very closely with uh, former governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and uh, I, I, I was very much involved in the California uh, green economy attempt. Well, I know that the cost is a huge debt. Um, not only that, but among others. Uh, now, it's very interesting, at the period of George W. Bush, you had the lobbies, which were more the petrol lobby, etc., and and Schwarzenegger tried to push the green economy. So he did it in his own uh, province. Then he made a coalition of eight governors from the West Coast and seven governors of the East Coast. Now I understand that in a certain way, New York and uh, New Jersey, even Chicago, they are taking some of those elements. And the US, uh, with its vitality, which is much superior to Europe, is sometimes uh, closing the gap and catching up. But both Europe and the US, we are losing ground versus emerging countries. The real champions, and we don't believe that, but it's true, are the Chinese and the Indians. That's where you have carbon offset uh, uh, trading centers. That's where they take a lot of um, initiatives. They have, again, that advantage that they don't have the same legacy, and they go straight with state-of-the-art technologies. China, China is still the biggest polluter. They are. They are. It's absolutely true. But at the same time, they have closed thousands of factories. At the same time, they need so much energy. I think one of the world's biggest problems is going to be the energy supply. And the needs of China, but India and Brazil and others, for energy is so high 
that they would do anything they can. They would build one nuclear plant a month, or start at the beginning of one nuclear plant a month. They have huge, highly polluting uh, coal uh, electricity plants, but in parallel to that, Two years ago, 40% of the solar production, solar panels production, were Chinese. Today, 60. Uh, they are world leader in the wind energy. They are world leader in the solar panel production because they also need it. And at the same time, they take measures much more drastic than in the US and in Europe on energy saving programs. They would close down entire sectors when that sector would be energy greedy. So, of course, they can also do it because they have a different system. I'm not going to enter into that. And they can easily decide, that's the new way. Shut up. Here we go. Yeah. They think long term. But at the end, we should get out from that idea that we are the angels and they are the polluters. They are doing a lot of things where they might end up higher up than us. And I speak globally, Europe and the US. Back to you. Some of the minutes of the Swiss quota, sometimes I will give to Dr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beck. <laughs> yeah. But maybe, Professor Prohaska, you can talk to us about the rest of the world. I mean, uh, Dr. Begley mentioned China, <laughs> India, and Brazil, but you know more there's, as well about the rest. Well, there's several countries that are doing a lot of good things, but they've, um, and they're recognized for that, so I don't know if everybody knows about it, but certainly Costa Rica was always the lead. Mm -hmm. And they uh, were recognized because they were like one of the first countries who really appreciated the environment and what they could do as far as sustainable tourism. And they are, they're still right up there at the top, but have been surpassed within about the last five years by Belize, because Belize seems to have uh, even greater restrictions. So those uh, two countries in, in that part of the world are doing great work. Um, I've traveled, I've been studying what's gone on in, to Bhutan, and that's a, certainly um, an amazing study in its own of what they're doing and in their whole tourism program and their hotel programs based on the environment. Uh, certainly Australia, I, as far as I, I look at Australia, what they're doing is great. I think they've implemented uh, the STEP program that was started by the OAS. So it's happening all around the world. And what I think is happening also is that a lot of good case studies are beginning to be developed, which is what people need. And people need to be shown that this is going to work. Very good. And if you don't mind, I'll ask you a question about because we approach it to the regulations and government's involvement, actually. Uh, what do you think is the role of government um, in all these sustainable development initiatives? Well, that's, I mean, it's a great question, and, and I think it actually ties directly into to this question of who's doing what um, and who's in the lead. I'll, for a second, play the very um, uncomfortable role of humble American and say that, yes, we are very far behind in terms of uh, our sustainability efforts and, and energy efficiency efforts, especially compared to Europe, where the, the situation, geographic constraints, kind of a history of limited resources, and then therefore resource pricing constraints, um, and a kind of a cultural preference and affinity uh, for, for, for being more efficient uh, has, uh, has made a big difference, as well as a kind of a, a much more top-down planning and development regulatory structure. I would say one of the good things, or one of the, the, the takeaways, though, from the U.S., and why I will uh, kind of uh, give us uh, some points, in, in this case at least, and some uh, glimmer of hope, uh, and this comes back to the regulations as well, is that what the, New York, what the U.S. has been very successful in doing is creating a, a market-led and market-driven solutions to energy efficiency. And I think this is going to really revolutionize how these things, how energy efficiency efforts are taken up across the globe. Um, we're seeing market-driven solutions in China, although they have the ability at the national level to say, you have to be more energy efficient. You have, you have to do it right now. Go do it. And that's the question. We can't do that in the United States. So what we see is the less of a role of the federal government, where the federal government kind of creates a broad framework or the platform, but we're seeing all, all the action happening at the city level. So we're seeing cities as market makers in many respects, that the cities are establishing the policies, like New York City's Greener Greater Buildings Plan, uh, the Plan NYC 2030 plan, that they're creating markets for energy efficiency and for sustainable real estate that didn't or wouldn't otherwise exist. So I think this is a key kind of interaction between the private markets and the public sector. That's great. Yeah. Unless someone has, you wanted to I was say just going to add also, um, having lived in Oregon a lot of my life, Oregon was really that in the Northwest, Washington State, were probably two of the leaders where you just sort of realized this was part of the way you lived. 
And it's taken a while for that to spread. But that also came from people who cared about the environment. And that's one of the things that's a big difference in the United States is that it's done at the local level. The people do it. It's a bottom-up groundswell where in so many other countries in the world, you have the government. You have the Ministry of the Environment, the Ministry of Tourism that do these things to put in the regulations and make things happen. Here, it's, it's we do it. Yeah. And that, that, you wanted to say yeah. Uh, I'd like to follow on what both said, and I fully agree. We see that in sustainable development, about 70% of the decisions are bottom-up. They are cities or provinces, and you need to have that approach. So it's why, by the way, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, we are promoting the city and the regional approach. So now we are working together the C40 of Mr. Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, mm -hmm. and the R20 of Schwarzenegger, where in the US and worldwide, we will use that bottom-up approach. It's much more efficient than if you have to work through countries. The problem is that most of the UN-driven organization, UNDP and uh, UNEP, and uh, name all of them, they have to work with the federal governments. And one of the problems is, again, the World Bank and the Asia Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, they all have to work with the shareholders, which are national governments. And we have to find a way, and Ban Ki-moon is now trying to help us, to push the bottom up and not the top down. Good. Very good. I'd like to go on and talk about certifications and measurements and uh, Dr. Kontoskoska. Uh, what's the future of green building certification? Uh, you know a lot about that. <laughs> And sustainability certifications, if you can answer specifically to that question. Um, sure. This has been kind of an interesting. I mean, obviously, the focus over the past 10 years now has been on the U.S. Green Building Council's lead rating system. It's really been a, a tremendous uh, tool to move the market. Um, I think where we're seeing, and then if you kind of uh, extrapolate that across the globe, there's about 500 similar systems across the globe. Each country, in many cases each region, in some cases each city, has determined that they have their own specific needs and want to have their own system, which you can imagine confuses things like <laughs> uh, multinational hotel operators and multinational investors. Um, what we're seeing, though, is a push away from things like LEED and these kind of rating systems, so to speak. Um, what they've done is actually work as a, as a market signal. And they've been a signal to investors, let's say, or tenants, uh, that a building has achieved a certain green level. Uh, but that's only effective when the tenants or the investors can't get enough information to judge for themselves. So what we're seeing now is a, an incredible emergence of energy performance data, water use data for individual buildings that will be available to the public and available to investors so they can make their own decisions. So I, I, I guess a, a quick analogy would be if you're looking at a box of cookies, right? On the front it says low fat, and on the side it says it has the nutrition label so you can judge for yourself, <laughs> right? You look at the calories, you can make a determination because you know how many calories you should be intaking and how many of that those cookies are gonna give you. If you didn't have that information about the calories, you would just judge by the low fat, right? The, that label on the front, and it's only as good as the person putting the label. You can't really trust it. So now we're, we're getting to the point where we actually have that calorie information for buildings so we can make those direct decisions ourselves or as investors. Thank you. Um, Dr. Begley, I had three specific questions, but in view of time, I'd like to maybe folk, try to um, have an answer, for, a global answer to the questions. It's about CO2 and the balance sheet. And we had a great conversation yesterday about accounting. You know, when are we going to start accounting for, um, you know, for sustainability? Well. If you want to track CO2 in the hospitality and tourism industry, I think you have three main components. First is the travel cost. Uh, by the way, when I worked for the logistics industry, we had organized where anybody who came to the meeting, they had to calculate their own personal CO2 balance sheet. And uh, well, I tell you, you had to learn a lot if you wanted to offset the cost of coming to the conference. Um, second, it's the building, where you have both the capex related, which is the materials, and normally it's isolation in order to reduce both your economic and your CO2 uh, footprint bill on warming in countries in the north and cooling in countries of the south. And it's uh, the whole energy efficiency and best practice program. Now I'd like to say, we now focus on CO2, but it's a wrong impression. 
because sometimes you should focus on other KPIs. For example, the water unit. You spoke about Australia. In Australia, they have a water stock exchange, uh, just normal plain water stock exchange, because water is the scarcity resource. Mm -hmm. Well, you hardly imagine here, but you have to define what are the needs of the water for the agriculture, what is the liters of water equivalent for one kilo of beef that has an impact on the catering industry, uh, versus what is the water you need for the industry, versus the water you need for the energy production, you know, cooling a, a nuclear plant, or it's very, very complicated. So water might be the scarcity factor, sometimes more alarming than CO2. Um, interesting is you need to define how you, you measure all of that, and uh, Sometimes the best way, if you really want to measure it in a proper way, you would go to the normal accounting. Take the logistics, the same data which you have for calculating your profit and loss, the same data would tell you how many kilometers a plane or a van has uh, been driven, and therefore you can calculate the emission of CO2. This is much more precise than vague reconciliation. You need uh, in, in those to also define what is your local component versus your external, another region component. One of the best examples, if you have, for example, your whole uh, reservation through computer system, remember that Google, only Google, is emitting as much CO2 that the entire German industry, because you have to cool the places where all those computers are. And nobody would calculate in New York, or in Germany, or in Japan, what is the cost of using a computer, which is absolutely huge in terms of carbon emissions. So we should go from just local CO2 calculation to a global understanding of what the whole value chain is producing and I stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Uh, I'd like now to, to go to part two of this presentation and, and talk about the three major stakeholders, the owners, the customers, and the employees' engagement. Um, and we'll try to be as brief as possible so that then we can leave some time for questions and answers. Um, in terms of owners, what should owner, hotel owners or franchisors or management companies and developers um, should do to expand sustainable development? Uh, maybe uh, Professor Santa? Um, sure. I, I think that, you know, we're seeing a lot of the demand for, for more sustainable properties actually coming from the consumer and the tenant much more than the owners. Um, so we're seeing that demand being driven from the bottom up in a lot of cases, and the owners are responding. Uh, I think one of the big issues that we're looking at now is, um, is reducing uncertainty for owners around um, not only moving into, when, especially when we think about retrofitting existing buildings, moving into more energy efficient uh, buildings. Uh, and doing those kind of retrofits where there's a lot of uncertainty about the energy savings around the technologies being used to do these things, uh, to do these types of retrofits. So reducing that uncertainty is a key uh, component, of, component of this, which will also reduce the cost of capital and free up a lot, of mo a lot more money to begin to scale up these well, initiatives. Actually, yeah, I wanted to ask you the cost implications for, for green buildings. Uh. And, and that comes into play. I mean, and broadly speaking, that everyone talks about green buildings costing more. The, the punchline is it really depends on what you're building and where. In New York City, a, a new uh, office building being built green or non-green, there's no additional cost in most cases. Um, as you move further outside of the major sophisticated markets in the CBDs, um, it's a very different question. I'm actually, I have a company outside of my work at NYU and I'm building a, a winery that's going to be hopefully lead platinum uh, about two hours east of New York City. And it's an area where the contractors, the suppliers, the architects, none of the team really understands what a green building is. So getting those materials, raising awareness among the people who actually have to be building the building uh, is a challenge. And there it actually does end up costing a, bin, a bunch more. Yeah. Uh, Professor Daly, uh, what is the impact of the green trend uh, on entrepreneurship and on even innovation? <clears throat> I'd say whenever, whenever there is a, a uh, significant shift, be it new technology, the internet, sustainability practices, that opens up tremendous er, uh, opportunities for innovation and entrepreneurship in general, uh, especially because 
it allows entrepreneurs to innovate at the business model level, the essence uh, of any business, whether it's harder for existing established companies to retrofit some of the sustainability practices into existing structures. For entrepreneurs, they start with a clean slate. They can think about the supplier relationships, the operational and resource challenges, the value proposition to customers, the way they want to save costs, uh, generate additional revenues. And we have a, I, I'm working also in the context of um, Ecole Hôtelière de Lausanne uh, with a business incubator that we've created and we see a lot of entrepreneurs coming through with more and more sustainability based uh, ventures. Uh, one of which was to create a five star experience in the middle of nowhere, so kind of a five star tent luxury concept. Uh, but they had the opportunity to, to, to build this really from the ground up and think about all the the issues and, and when you think of five stars and typical requirements, you think of very unfriendly uh, environmental practices such as um, uh, I don't know, you need a heated tower rail, for instance. <laughs> you need uh, two pillows per person. You need individual shampoo bottles. So Five Star is very unfriendly in general, but they were able to, uh, because they put it in the heart of their business model, create a Five Star value proposition in pristine areas. Yep. Well, from the owner point of view, I would say it's uh, first think long term and not just quarterly results. So bring a long term perspective in the way how you create uh, uh, economic value to the total company with discounted cash flows and terminal value. Uh, second, it's awareness. It should cross the boardrooms from one boardroom to the next boardroom. That, that question is an important one, and I think it's coming, but it's quite important that it's spreading evenly. Three, it's going to be on uh, lobby. You need to lobby against the government because very often we will be on PPP, a public-private partnership, and we need stable rules. And that's coming back to the question of regulatory. Example, Spanish government created a huge incentive for the solar industry, and once the government of Spain was broke, they had signed 20 years contract, and they broke the contract because they said, now we can't pay anymore. This is totally unacceptable. So there must be a very strong lobby by the owners on the government, on Capitol Hill, and on the equivalent on the other countries, to have a stable political environment so that we can develop that. Fourth, it's definitely the real estate and property, because that's where normally owners put most of their money, and fifth, in the processes. Very good. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to jump now to guest perspective, and, uh, and as well a bit of marketing. Um, Professor Pohaska, mm -hmm. uh, how important is sustainability when it comes to guests choosing a hotel or a destination? It depends on the, the guest, quite frankly, There's, and it depends on their interest. There's definitely a growing interest in people that want to go and stay in a hotel that's environmentally friendly, that also is very sustainable, but it's still a small portion when you look at the studies, and I think because a lot of people don't even understand what is all involved. So it's growing, uh, and it will continue to grow, but right now it's usually not a priority when I... Uh, Professor Daly, do you have anything to say about, you know, guests, are they ready to pay an extra cost for, for green? No, no, I think I, w I would tend to agree. I mean, if there is, if there, if there is any green premium, it's, it's likely to be very moderate. Uh, first, there is also a certain level of confusion still about what really is a green hotel. And, you know, you need to have tangible things for people to be able to quantify and compare. Um, it's also more of a... You know, the core value proposition of a hotel is very tangible. It's a bed, it's a good night's sleep, it's an experience through various touch points. Uh, green benefits are a little more intangible, it's a little more behind the scenes. It's hard to uh, generate extra money for this. And uh, uh, the last thing I would say is also, if customers understood really that, you know, this isn't the financial interest of, of the hotel to actually uh, be more green, then there is a question of whether they would expect to some of those green savings to be shared between the operator and uh, the guest themselves. So I think that the pricing power of a green premium is very limited at most. And to follow up on this question with you, um, what strategies should be used by the hoteliers actually to sort of entice customers to, to go green? I think you could divide it in both long-term and short-term strategies. I think because it is a long-term trend, at some point there is some strategic brand management uh, effort that needs to happen. You need to position the hotel group in the mind of consumers as, uh, you know, as having a key differentiators that relate to sustainability. But that's kind of a long, long-term work. In the short term, there are you know, basic strategies you can use. It's true that functional benefit messages don't work so well because it is more about intangible benefits. You're talking about 
uh, ethics and morals, and, and sometimes more uh, psychological or emotional marketing works better. I'll take a quick example. There was a study that was run where, you know, well know those, um, you know, help us save some, some water and recycle your, your linens. Uh, and uh, there was a study where they split half the rooms in a hotel, and they had the standard message, you know, we save 10 liters for uh, whatever. And, and they tried in another room a different set of message, which was most of the guests at this hotel have reused their towels at least once. And it was a significant increase. Yes, pressure. Exactly. It's, it's, it's really uh, a social proof, which is when you're uncertain about how to behave, you will turn to a peer group to see how they've done, for, and, and, you know, looking for guidance. Oh, I'm just going to say, in, I did look at a uh, study that was done in Europe about four years ago, and they said, that would people pay extra to stay in the hotel room? And basically, it came out and said they would spend over a two-week period 150 extra dollars. So that uh, comes out to about $10 a day. So if I were a hotelier, I would just build that into the cost and, and definitely um, make sure the message is there. And there are people are, that are so much more aware that are searching the internet that will find those kind of hotels. But it, a lot of people expect it. But there's still a lot. Uh, Searching the internet, actually, uh, Accor, you know, the French hotel group, uh, just published uh, a marketing study that they made uh, with 7,000 of their hotel customers and, and their feedback about uh, sustainability. So I encourage you to, unfortunately, <laughs> it's, fr it's a French company. They <laughs> left it in French. They didn't translate it in English. We can use Google Translate. Yeah, we can. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but it's very interesting. At least it's a first study with 7,000 people, which is quite interesting, delivering some nice information. Did they ask anything about if they pay extra? Yes, they did. And 66% of customers would say they would pay extra. Um, I'm not convinced of that. I agree with you that you know, I don't feel as a hotelier that people are really ready to do that. But definitely, in, in, there's one item that they are ready to pay a bit more. It's organic food. Yeah. I noticed that people are ready to pay a bit more when it comes to food and beverage. Uh, sorry, Dr. Begley. I think in the holistic experience, what is interesting is it could be the hotel chain as a brand. But now we see that sometimes a country becomes a brand. You spoke about Bhutan. They replaced the national growth product by national happiness product. Um, you, you have Incredible India, where they go on completely different values than the, 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 the capitalist world. But I'd like to put forward the example of the Maldives. Mm -hmm. The Maldives, mm -hmm. they were worried, which personally I don't believe at all, <laughs> that uh, if you have climate change, the whole Maldives would be They're under the sea. Right. And it's why the Council of Ministers, they had uh, a diving uh, Council of Ministers. That's just marketing. Yes. But what they used, now they have worked with Rothschild Investment Bank on 140 different green hospitality projects to turn the whole Maldives experience as a green experience. And it's prompted by the government itself. So now it's all going to be renewable energy, it's all going to be waste management, and then, and then. So it's interesting to see that sometimes it's, it's a chain, hotel chain, and sometimes it's a country which decides to become green. And I'd like to, to jump now to the last part of this uh, session, which is about employee engagement. It's something that I face as well every day, actually. I'd like to uh, ask you as well uh, what you think. Uh, you know, are the right behaviors spread throughout the organization? Well, uh, you know, I think that in terms of employee engagement, two important things are, of course, education uh, and also empowerment, I think, is a key element, which is, is, is somewhat difficult in top-down hierarchical, hierarchical organizations where you, you really need to have employees engage and feel like they're contributing and that their ideas, which are in many cases the best ideas about how to actually improve the efficiency of a, of a building, for example, um, can be kind of trickled up and scaled up uh, through the chain. But one point I would like to make, though, it comes back to the employee engagement, but also this guests and, and owners as well. I mean, I think that for the students in the room, I think the main thing that you're going to do coming out of here, hopefully, will be changing the organizations that you go into. That you'll be responsible for being that change agent, for the champion for these kind of things. And the important thing to understand is that you need that passion, uh, but you, you have to be careful about kind of the, the kind of uh, normative, moralistic, you should do this, you should do that. What you have to understand is the, the value proposition. What's a wonderful thing about sustainability in this field is that people have a lot of different motivations, but it all gets to the same place. So you need to understand that there are some people that will respond to the moral and legacy aspects. 
There's the owners who will respond to the value proposition, that this will add revenue, that this will create a marketing advantage. Um, and then, you know, for example, it's Veterans Day, the Veterans Day, I mean, you look at the U.S. Marines in Afghanistan, they view sustainability as saving lives. That's how they actually cr calculate that value. By having solar panels, it reduces the, uh, the necessity, necessity to carry battery packs, which reduces the weight on the, on the Marines and allows them to travel farther, lighter, and be more self-sufficient. So you really have to understand who your, ta your audience is and how you present that case is going to be critical to actually being able to effectuate that change. Very good point. Dr. Begley, um, how do you track and monitor uh, KPIs, key performance indicators? Well, as I mentioned before, I think if you have an ad hoc system, it's likely to fail. The best is to plug the track and trace system on your variable indicators for the profit, the bottom line. So if you have numbers which are in a very accurate manner checked because you will have the profit of the company and you will have the bonus of the managers linked to that. Try to ensure that you use the same indicators for your sustainable development. In many cases, it is possible. I know one case, it's the TNT company, Dutch Post. Peter Bakker is now the head of the a very large organization, which is the Business Council for Sustainable Development. It's absolutely feasible, it's proven. We need to have measurables element, and we need to have a component of the bonus of the senior and medium management linked to the sustainable development. And it has already happened, and it works. And Professor Deli, uh, maybe a last question for you. And how do you think that, how could we engage our staff I think it comes back to the point that was made. It's about ownership, it's about empowerment. And uh, like any project, be it you want to deploy a CRM system or you want to have more innovative practices, it always comes back to, in the end, a cultural and human change within the organization. I think the technology and the peripheral aspects are always solvable. Uh, the crux lies with the people. Very good. Well, I think maybe in view of time, I, I would suggest that we keep the question and answer session for this panel at the end of the second panel, if you don't mind, then you'll be sitting here. And then uh, we, I, I guess we can take a break now. Uh, thank you very, very much. It was very interesting. Really learned a lot.